Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hey girls, and welcome to a, another episode of the Women's Fitness Academy's podcast. I'm your host, Siggy, one of the WFA's educators and a women's online coach. Um, I hope wherever you are in the world that you are nourished, you're happy, and you're staying active. Today, we have a special guest. Um, this guest, I've personally had the absolute pleasure of um, to working with her, to be um, coached by her, mentored, and to call her a friend of mine. Now, girls, I want you to please welcome Holly Sinclair from the Women's Series. Holly, before we dive into today's chat, could you please tell our listeners um, a short or a long summary of who you are, what exactly is um, that you do, and what is your favourite movie and why? Well, that's random. I know. (laughs) Well, maybe I'll just say The 8 Mile because I watched it on the weekend. Yes, Eminem. It's the the best rap battle ever at the end. Yes. Um, Love a movie. And I fucking love Eminem. So we'll just go with The 8 Mile. He's so dope. Yeah, (laughs) love him. Good Um, choice. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm obviously Holly and I run a women's health business called The Women's Series. Um, And I also actually run an outpatient rehab program called Connection Based Living as well. Um, But that's sort of like a side thing that I do. Uh, But yeah, so I've been in the industry for uh, nearing on like 16 years now with majority of that time being on the gym floor. And then the past sort of three years, it gets a bit blurry with COVID because I feel Mm. like, I feel like I started my online business like yesterday, but you know, it's actually almost been been a while. Yeah. It's been a while now. It's been three years now. So being online, working more so in the functional medicine space um, and not really, if ever having anything to do with training now, although it was such a big part of, yeah, my coaching journey for so many years. Mm -hmm. I love that. Let's, before we dive into what you're doing now, let's chat about where you started off. You know, um, it's been over 16 years since you've been coaching. For our listeners, most of them are going to be either new to the fitness and health industry or becoming a personal trainer. What is the biggest mistake that you see that our coaches are doing these days that can be avoided? Well, first part of that question was, where I started and I actually started in Fernwood which is crazy um at at 17 I was on the reception there and um this sort of brings us into the second point which is what coaches are doing wrong (laughs) because I got to see it firsthand in those like big box gyms like Fernwood I never went into the fitness first or South Pacifics but um I definitely started in a big box gym and knowing what I know now and also learning along the way of how to be a great coach. Like I just look at what most of those people were doing and I just think, mate, you know, they, there was never any structure. There was no periodization for their clients. Um, there was literally no reasoning for exercises, you know, so so many plyometric-based stuff and bozu balls and all that. Balls. Yeah, like all that sort of stuff. And Uh, not knowing then when I was young and 17 but reflecting back now I just think like clearly those trainers and coaches were not investing at all in why they were actually doing the exercise that they were doing with their client Um, and for the most part I'm sure most of them just rocked up and made it up on the spot right I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case Um, and when you start to understand like the intricacies of biomechanics and and also biochemistry how the body works how it operates you you just cannot then go into a session and make it up as you go because there's so many different variables that could be happening for that client that say putting them on a bozu ball it could be the absolute worst thing you're going to do for them um, even though they feel like they're working and they're sweating So I think that's probably the biggest mistake that coaches make um, and that I've seen is 
there's just zero preparation and probably zero care to, mm. to what they're actually applying to their client when they go into those sessions. Yeah, it's okay to have a scenario where, you know, you just make somebody sweat and you do a body weight circuit or you use a sled. Like that's not the end of the world. But if you're p- putting people under load, like especially in, in like under bars or you're deadlifting or anything like that and you've got no structure... Ugh, that's like a big recipe for disaster ultimately and injuries <laughs> well yeah and like I see it all like uh, lots of my friends I'm sure you're the same like with clients and stuff like they always get injured in the gym yeah and I just think yeah because I've seen you at the gym and you do like a, a one third of a squat with like so much weight on and your knees are buckling it's like what are you doing doing (laughs) but they do it because their trainer or their coach or people that they see at the gym are also doing that at the same time so yeah monkey see monkey do that's it that's it so I'd say that's definitely one of the biggest mistakes and then the other big mistake that coaches have is they don't invest in their understanding of health you know because so much of how somebody moves comes down to external factors like what they're eating what their digestion's doing, how well they're breathing, how much they've slept the night before. You know, all of these different um, things can impact how the person's going to operate and move their body the next day. So while it might sound good to just say, get deeper in the squat or push through it or, you know. Go hard or go home. Yeah, go hard or go home. It's like, yeah, but, you know, are their joints hurting because they're inflamed? And if they're inflamed putting them under load is going to put them at a lot of risk. So they're probably the two biggest mistakes. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that because a big thing, you know, from the early years that I was a coach, to be honest, like I didn't really invest in myself or in the education to teach other clients. And it's so funny how you mentioned like Fernwood. I remember when I just, when I first started, I didn't go to Fernwood. I went to another one called um, Curves, I think it was called. Oh, my God, I swear, I think it was, like, the best day of my life. My mom's like, I'm signing up to a gym. And I got this trainer and she gave me, like, a list of exercises. And I reckon there was probably about 20 exercises to do. And she's like, you're just going to go through the circuit and just go as many times as you can. And I reckon after that, I was just like, this is fucking shit. Like, <laughs> what, what is this? I Like, there's more out there. And, you know, luckily enough, after that, I did pursue the coaching side of things but yeah investing in yourself is is huge um and again it comes with in levels you know for our listeners they may be doing the the set three set four right now but post that there's like a flora of education out there and I love how you mentioned that we also need to invest in ourselves as much as investing um whether it's for our you know, education or business or for for our clients because if we're not understanding what's actually happening in our body, how are we supposed to understand what's happening in your client's body? Oh, for sure. And I remember doing that when I was like a new trainer. I didn't lift heavy. Mm -hmm. I I was a cardio bunny. Oh, me too. Right? So, I mean, my version of exercise was a 20K run. But then I would be PTing people with squats and deads And I'd never experienced that load on my body myself, but I was trying to get somebody else to do it, which is just bizarre, Mm. Um, really, when I think back. So, you know, if you don't have that, um, that, what's that, uh, that somatic response to understanding what you're asking your client to do, it's going to become very difficult for you to actually coach them properly. Yeah, 100%. Just having more skill and understanding of what you're putting your client through. And again, you know, with all the education that I've done and, you know, yourself, I'm so thankful for over the years is having a better understanding um, of that. Now, you mentioned when you were speaking about um, the mistakes and how looking for clients when putting them under load, you also mentioned the... um, holistic side of things like the nutrition the sleeping um what are some factors that you look out for when you get a new client 
Yeah, well, um, I'm not on the floor anymore, but when I was on the gym floor, like a, a big telltale sign that something's going on is when your clients constantly lean on things or when they sit down in between sets um, because that's their body preempting fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really good sign that they've got a lot of underlying adrenal issues and stress issues um, that probably need to be addressed. And if we look at training as a supplement to our overall health, there are different types of training templates that can be utilized for somebody that has low cortisol, which is like low stress hormones, um, people that have high cortisol or high stress hormones. Um, so if you're, for example, putting somebody, you know, under a heavy load above 80%, that's going to be seriously taxing on their nervous system. Um, and so if somebody has really poor adrenal output, so they've, they've just basically cooked, uh, that's not going to be a great training template for them, which in that instance, they might benefit more from something like a gymnastic based template or um, functional hypertrophy rep ranges where you're just like greasing the groove, but you're not actually loading up too much um, you know, in terms of their weights and so forth. So that's a really good thing to look out for. I think also like when you're watching people move, how well are their joints, um, what, what's their mobility doing? Because basically if they've got poor mobility in say the squat, they can't break parallel or their ankles are really stiff, that's a good sign that they've got a lot of scar tissue build up. And that usually is a byproduct again of excess levels of cortisol. Um, so, you know, what's going on with their stress hormones and then consequently what's happening with the fluids that coat the joints, like the synovial fluid, why aren't they, um, rich enough to be able to grease the groove or get you into a good state of mobility. Um, so that can tell you a lot about their health when somebody's moving through a barbell exercise and they just collapse and their weak point is their stomach. So you just see them like flop forward on a squat or, you know, they just can't brace properly, which is the most overused word in history. Um, that can tell you that they've got a lot of digestive issues. You know, if somebody can't brace properly, it's probably because they've got a lot of inflammation around their abdomen. Um, and that has a lot to do with what's going on in their gut. So it's not going to matter how many times brace, 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 brace right? It's not really going to matter how many times you say that to someone. If they have ongoing digestive issues, they're never going to be able to do that properly. And if they can't brace properly, well, guess what? Then you put their lumbar spine at a vulnerability. You know, you put their thoracic spine at a vulnerability. And that's where niggles start to present. And unfortunately, for some people, like really bad injuries can start to present. So like the bulging discs. Like bulging discs. Um, but there's so many things that you can look for in how somebody is like in just the way that they move, that's going to tell you what's happening from a holistic health standpoint, even like mouth breathers, because mm. if somebody's mouth breathing, they're going to have that forward head tilt position. Um, and so instantly they're probably going to be anteriorly dominant, which means you need to do work on their posterior chain a lot more. Um, and then also they've got that like crow neck position where their jaw is coming forward because that's how they're receiving air. And so if that's the case, you know, that they've got no, little nitric oxide going into their brain, which is a problem because, you know, we need that for healthy blood flow um, and to manage our stress response. So again, like there's so many things that you can look for as to how somebody's reacting. And even like when you're with somebody and their energy, you need to be a really good observer as a coach. So, you know, are they, are they looking you in the eye when you're mm. talking? Are they sort of shifting their body around, like not being able to sit still constantly? Fidgety, like yeah, moving, yeah. fidgety people. Um, you know, all of those very minute cues can give you an understanding of what's happening internally for them, from a nervous system perspective, a stress perspective, um, an internal dialogue perspective, all of that sort of stuff, and that has massive carryover to not just their training, but also like your your ability to coach them into a better state of health. So training is great. And I really appreciate the people who specialize in just the, the biomechanic side of things. But I do think that just doing that has a massive limitation on your clients because, you know, 
sometimes it's not a matter of stretching the calf muscle or getting stronger in your hamstrings or, you know, getting deeper in the hole to improve on a squat. Sometimes in order to improve on that lift, you're going to have to manage their stress response. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to look at their sleep rates. You're going to have to look at what they're putting in their mouth from an inflammatory standpoint, you know. So it has to be both when you're, when you're training somebody for sure. Yeah, I love that. It's a collective of variables and, you know, it's so important for, for coaches to understand, like you mentioned, it's not just the training, it's everything together. Mm. Um, in terms of the nutrition, I really love how you mentioned about the bracing of the core and the, and the gut health. Um, I totally relate to that because I remember when I bulged my, like the disc in my lower back, I had a really shitty nutrition. I was overly stressed and was training like a stupid mad woman. Like I was training like five, six times a week when I literally should have just done it like two or three times. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the gut health and training, can you dive a little bit deeper into like the science of that? Uh, like in terms of what happens from a gut health standpoint? Well, yeah, you know, like if someone can't brace properly, like in terms, like what should they be looking out for with, oh, right. with their health in terms of nutrition? Yeah. I mean, the obvious ones is you need to to remove anything that could potentially be inflammatory which these days is a big list of foods. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the easiest template to go off is always going to be a paleo-based template um, because ultimately that's just eating real food and you're eliminating anything that could potentially be triggering from gluten right through to sugars, through to preservatives, um, all of that sort of stuff. And for some people, they're going to tolerate things better than others. Like dairy is a really good example of how you know, some people can tolerate dairy quite well. And in that case, it's not inflammatory, but it's the quality of the dairy that you're consuming. Um, whereas others can't tolerate dairy that well. And that in that case, they really just should not have it. Mm-hmm. So, um, but there's obviously a spectrum of foods that you would want to try and avoid first to improve somebody's inflammation in their gut. But also, uh, and this actually is an Olympic lifting thing, you you need to take a north to south approach when it comes to somebody's digestion because your digestion ultimately starts in your brain in the cephalic phase. And if you, coming back to Olympic lifting, if you have poor mind to foot connection because your feet are the furthest point from your brain, so you can test your clients in terms of getting them to do footwork skills or because Olympic lifting, you obviously have to come up, get that triple extension on your ankles and then drop back down. If somebody has poor mind foot connection, you instantly know they're going to have issues with their digestion Mm -hmm. because that whole cephalic phase of um, digestion starts in the brain and then obviously has flow on to their mouth, to their stomach, to their intestines, and then their colon. Um, So watching somebody's feet is actually a really good way to see what's going on in their brain. Um, And if the two aren't aligning very well, then you got to figure out what's going on with their brain. Like, is their brain inflamed? Um, And again, that can come down to the type of nutrition they're eating, what they're being exposed to, mold, as we were talking about earlier. Um, You know, are they getting enough sleep? Sleep's a big one. So if somebody's rocking up to a 5.30 a.m. training session, but they only got to bed at midnight, you got to send them home. I used to send my clients home. I used to yeah. get girls come be like, so like I only slept about three hours, but I'm totally fine to like just train and let's go hard. I'll be like, see you later. Yeah. Like I'm not training you today. No, because their nervous system is just, it's, it's not going to cope. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you have obviously a threshold where you can push through those sorts of moments when you're younger, but as you get older, there's a time and place. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the capacity to just keep doing that is um, it wanes. But sleep under it's not sleeping enough is a big issue as well. So there's so many factors. But back to your point around what to do with digestion, I just I honestly think nutrition is the most superior way to fix somebody's gut. And if you can just get your client to commit to that sort of paleo 
anti-inflammatory template, man, it'll make their actual movement so much better. Um, and they'll feel better as well. So true. And there's so much mis- misinformation out there, you know, when when I just started um, with my own fitness um, journey, you know, you just eat whatever you can when you fit into your your mat, your calories, you know, that flexible dieting stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's very interesting. And people don't and realize even, how cool. She, yeah. Sorry, see, even like soft tissue injuries, like that's a that's a sign of histamine problems. Mm. So like again, like if somebody just has niggles all the time, they're just chronically inflamed. Like it's got nothing to do with their training at that point. Um, so again, nutrition is going to be really important there. But sorry, yeah, cut you off. huge factor. Well, you know what? Like the guy has what was it? Like eighty percent of like lost my seventy um, percent of the immune system. Yes, you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. super important their mm. gut um, for their overall health, but also specifically how they move. Mm. Let's go back to the moving. You mentioned something about the feet and the nutrition. What oh, yeah. would you what would you look um look out for with the feet? Well, if they just like have lag time, so especially when you're doing like um cleans, if you do like Olympic lifting cleans with the barbells, um, or like shuttle runs, um, any type of footwork or foot skills, like one-legged hops, that sort of stuff, if they've got a lag or they just like can't pick their feet up properly. Mm, I'd say that there's stuff going on with their brain at that point because for whatever reason, it's not firing quickly enough. Mm. Um, So like in that instance, you can use in between sets, you can use exercises to improve the plasticity of the brain. So things like juggling or Zen Archer or balance beams. Um, And that can be what you do on your rest period between your squats. You know, that can be super effective for some people. That's so cool. I love that. Mm. just doing something completely different than the the, stru- the usual structure that people um, put you through well usually people just sit down yeah and then they just have a chat or maybe you might jump on a mobility ball or a foam roller in between sets but or oh, my favorite is people mo- mobilize in between sets and I'm oh my god up. don't get me started on that <laughs> oh my god please do not do that no 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 <laughs> No, no, no. Um, but yeah like brain-based exercises are really they're fun as well you know um so i used to like t- people can test themselves on this juggle in between a squat set versus juggling in between a deadlifting set and you'll see how much deadlifting cooks your nervous system mm. because your hand eye coordination is so much worse um in that scenario than during squats so you get that like instant feedback yeah it's interesting it's, um, it's amazing the body. I, lo- I love everything about it. It's so fascinating. Mm. Um, well, also hanging, like hanging or uh, grip strength is such a good oh, sign. love it. Yeah. Yeah, such a good sign of your nervous system. So if you can't, I mean, you should be able to hold a two-minute hang. So if you can't hold a two-minute hang, that means your nervous system is shot. Mm-hmm. I, used, I remember I used to, we used to do a two-hour um, uh, assessment on new clients at the last gym I worked at and part of that assessment we would do a hang test and honestly like I remember there's some people who couldn't even hang for longer than five seconds Mm. that's terrifying yeah you know like their nervous system just didn't have the capacity to even handle five seconds yeah you know so that's a good test that you can do with your clients to see whether or not they're capable of even deadlifting on that day get them to hang first thing of their session okay did you hit two minutes cool we can deadlift today but if you're failing after 20 seconds, uh, today is not the day to deadlift. What would you do then? Well, you just have to move to more of a squad or whatever. But because deadlifting is so taxing on your central nervous system, um, you know, if they're already taxed, it's not going to be great for them. Maybe you move to a trap bar. I don't know. Depending on the client. Yeah, for sure. Would that, would that be in relation back to um, nutrition as well? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it, your nervous system gets impacted by so many things. Mm. Sleep's a really big one. Um, emotional stresses, under eating. Under eating is a really big problem. Um, and then when you do eat, obviously, if the quality of the food is poor, lack of protein. Um, so common. 
so common yeah like and all these things are super common yeah right and then we wonder why so many people do injuries in the gym Mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit more about the under eating like i've been there i know you have you've With your background, you know, before fitness, you um, mentioned several times um, to myself and your listeners um, online that you came from a background of restricting mm-hmm. your, your calories. Um, do you mind telling us more about that? Yeah, like, I mean, I'm sure like most women, uh, everyone's gone through a period where they've tried to diet or restrict food, probably had an undiagnosed eating disorder for the most part. <laughs> which is certainly what happened to me. Um, I went plant-based. I went vegan for three years. Uh, and then trans- before that I was vegetarian. Then I went vegan. Then I went back to vegetarian. And then I turned over to the dark side of carnivore, uh, <laughs> of paleo. But um, yeah, for a long time there, like I was so undernourished. And not only was I plant-based, which was terrible from a nourishment standpoint, but I was under eating as a plant-based mm. dieter so and I was over exercising I was doing like 10 15k runs every day which is just I even the thought of doing that now gives me PTSD like I just couldn't give me anxiety <laughs> I just couldn't even imagine doing that now um but I you know you just get into this weird headspace so And because of all of that, I lost my menstrual cycle and I Mm. lost it for quite some time. Um, And I had a lot of misdiagnosis of PCOS. And um, I remember one doctor at one point said I just had depression. And, you know, so it was all, it was a wild time. Um, But as soon as I just committed to eating more calories and then bringing back in like animal proteins and products like dairy and meat, Um, I instantly got my bleed back. So I think it just sort of shows, especially for me anecdotally, that um, under eating and avoiding really important food sources are just so detrimental to your health, you know. And I was so physically weak back then. Like I thought I was strong, but I wasn't, Mm. you know. And then as I transitioned on to more, really got into my weightlifting because I was feeling so good. And I actually started to squat heavy, you know, getting up to like 80, 90 kilo squats at 55 kilos. Like that's when you're like, yeah, you're like, yeah, I'm fucking strong. I'm not there anymore because I did a back injury. But, you know, I think it just it's just testament to committing to nourishment ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nourishment and the sleep side of things. And like you mentioned before, with the sleep, if you're not getting enough sleep, guess what? You're going to make really bad um, choices and it's just going to like have a really severe cycle from that. Oh, for sure. For sure. So it's all integrated, you know, and even like it's a transition process, Mm. you know, like I might have started eating meat and doing weight training, but I was still going out on the weekends. Yeah. And then it was like, yeah, it was like the process of, letting go of that aspect of myself and Mm. once once I like fully invested into my health like totally authentically integrally invested into myself like yeah I felt amazing because I was sleeping properly and I was eating properly I pulled back on my early hours um that was a big issue for me as a trainer like just starting it in the fours it just Mm. used to kill my nervous system so you know, I moved to more of an 8 a.m. start and all of a sudden, like, you're like, whoa. I this feel, is life. This is <laughs> life, baby. Um, and that's how everyone should feel ultimately, especially our yeah. clients, but they don't. Well, let's go back to the, the early mornings. Like what advice would you have for a new coach just starting out on the floor oh. when, you know, you know you have to do certain, like, mornings to work your way up to, you know, having a full... Um, Babe, I would honestly say don't do it. Mm. I would honestly say just commit to like big evenings and don't start before 7 a.m. Like it's just like if I reflect back on my time as a trainer on the gym floor, the most contributing issue to my health was the hours. Yeah. Like they fucked me up. You know, it didn't matter how well I was eating, how much I was eating, 
what supplements I was taking, getting up at 4 a.m., going into like a techno room with blue lights everywhere, you know, dealing with other people's energy all day, which is like people really forget about that. Like coaches all day, every day, we are taking on board somebody else's energy. And in any given day, like back in the day, and I'm sure you're the same, I would see 12 to 14 clients a day, like one hour sessions. So it's like, that's a lot of energy. Then you're expected to train yourself, uphold the image, and then you're home at 9.30. It's like your nervous system just doesn't have time to recover. So how good would it have been if we had our sage sticks and our like Palo Santo and just (laughs) go around people and be like, don't talk to me. I know. But as soon as I said, no, I'm not doing 5.30 starts anymore and I moved to 7 a.m., like everything changed for me. Mm -hmm. So I would just, honestly, I would just encourage people not to do it. I would encourage people to start at like, yeah, 7. You can get a lot, you can get two or three clients in. You can do heaps. From 7 till 9, especially now. Like the environment of work's changed so much. People will Mm. find once gyms reopen, you'll find that clients can see you at very odd hours now. Because most people will continue working from home. Yeah. Um, There's more flexibility. For sure. You know, you'll be able to pick up way more lunchtime clients. um, And, yeah, and just avoid that toll on your nervous system. Mm. I love that. What would you say is, like, the one lesson that you learned from all of that? Oh, you just got to listen to yourself. Mm. Yeah. There was, like, many, many nights where I was, like, I'm pretty sure I'm having a heart attack. And my my husband was, like, you're not having a heart attack. (laughs) you're just having a panic attack. It's because you're tired. You know, like it got really bad for me um, Mm. towards the end of my career in gyms purely because of the hours that I was working. I just, my body just couldn't take it anymore. Um, And I ignored that for a really long time. Like I just muscled my way through it because you do, as a trainer, you do have a certain type of personality. Like most trainers are very hardworking. They go hard or go home. Um, They're type A's. So, yeah, I just ignored it for a long time, which, you know, it probably has taken years off my life at the other end. But (laughs) I think for most trainers, it's just don't ignore how you're feeling ultimately. And that's that's the same with like even when you're working with clients. Mm -hmm. Like I think back and I think, why the fuck did I put up with that client for so long? You know, like I should have just fired them yeah you know but let you them do, go yeah you do these things because you think you have to but you don't you don't um, exactly it's that fear yeah for sure and then people start clients start to become just a, a number like a money number and that's not what you want either no you it want numbs to be, you inside as well for sure but if you've got if you've gone to the effort to educate yourself upskill yourself like you're in a position where you don't need to charge low rates So if you're giving enough value, you can do less clients, have better clients um, and be way more fulfilled Mm -hmm. than sort of that rat race of, you know, 40 clients. I mean, I just think I used to do 40 clients a week. Same. What the fuck? That's crazy. I have nightmares thinking about that. (laughs) Literally, babe, like (laughs) on the floor, standing all day, just, yeah, yeah, crazy you know, and trying to manage everything else at the same time. So you just think. Well, managing your life, like, you know, yeah. you're 40 hours on the floor taking care of everyone else. What yeah. about yourself? You know? Yeah. And mo- but- most of the time that doesn't happen. You end up just falling away. Yeah, that's right. And the issue is in PT world. I don't know if it'll be the same now post COVID, but back then, like it was like a badge of honor. Mm. You know, yeah, like, how, well, how many hours much- are you doing? Are you busy? <laughs> Oh my yeah. God, you look so busy. It's so good. No, yeah. don't like yeah. that whatsoever. Yeah. No. You know, no. like I, I used to manage a lot of trainers and like they just, I just used to remember that I'd be doing 42 book sessions managing the floor and then I'd have trainers who were doing 12 book sessions a week complaining and I'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> but in a weird egotistical way, I was like, yeah, I'm fucking churning and burning and I'm still mm-hmm. going, you know. Um, but yeah, I think just you need that to- comes that comes down to us being programmed, you know, that that busyness, that go to um, mindset. And I think over the 
the last few years for myself and I've noticed it with you as well it's just you need to take a step back 100 percent. you can't always just go 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 and the less you do the more you get back seriously it's amazing it's true it's true and it's also not conducive like for where I am in life in terms of like baby making years and starting mm. a family and stuff like that output is not conducive to my personal goals. Whereas when I was 20, well, yeah, I guess that was conducive to my personal goals would make heaps of money. Yeah. Um, which you can still do. <laughs> it's just, yeah, you have to have that offset. Honestly, Sig, sometimes I watch people's Instagram stories and I'm like, this is giving me anxiety. You are like turbocharged like constantly like content, 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 content. And I'm like, yo, you need to pump the brakes. Like your nervous mm-hmm. system is going to fry out. Yeah. That's, um, that's how you burn out. Yeah, for sure. But mm-hmm. it's just the culture we're in now, you know, because everyone looks at everybody else's socials and says, oh, The comparison, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And this, this comes down to what you said exactly just before is just valuing your yourself your authentic self and knowing what's actually right for you to do not because someone else is doing it exactly that's right so but that would be my advice just listen to your intuition yeah awesome well you know what you actually just summarized my next question because I was going to ask you what advice do you have for a new coach in the industry unless there's anything else that you can think of I think you just got to invest into yourself like you have to I was really fortunate that the job I got after Fernwood was with um, a company called Fitline who don't exist anymore, but they were like a boutique studio in the city. And it was there that I did my biosignature. I did F- mm. I did the first FA seminar with Mark Buckley, right? Like I did mine with John Sharp. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's taking me back to like Hands memories. John Sharp. Oh, um, so handsome. But I'm like, yeah, I'm a dinosaur. But, um, <laughs> you know, like that's where I got exposed to that side of things in the fitness industry. And I always think like because I had a crossroad moment, I could have gone to South Pacific, but I got this job at Fitline and I took the job at South Pacific. But the owner at Fitline called me and said, no, 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 like come here. You won't mm-hmm. regret it. And so I did. And I was so fortunate Like, because if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be where I am today because they exposed me to all of these new different yeah biosignature and fma and metabolic and that's where i did my first check course and you know and so i think just investing in yourself and your education is so 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 important um because otherwise you're just going to be one of those shit trainers in a commercial gym not knowing anything about programming looking at their phone (laughs) please don't be that or the ones who eat food while they're training oh my god i haven't seen that that's heavy oh that that brings me so many memories for working at Good Life. Seriously, the train was just eating their food. We're going five, four, three. Oh, my like. God. Yeah. I never understood. I never understood clients that continued to pay those people. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's not okay. So, yeah, for our listeners, if you're becoming a new PT, please do not use your phone unless, obviously, you're following a program and you have to use it. But even though I, I always liked using um, an iPad or just – a folder just to yeah. write it out I have manually. Paper, paper programs for sure. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, don't eat while you're training them, please. So irresponsible. <laughs> so responsible. Um, cool. I think that pretty much sums up everything that we wanted to um, chat about. So awesome. girls, if you enjoyed today's um, podcast, please don't hesitate to screenshot the screen tag the women's fitness academy tag myself siggy fisher and holly which is at the women's series i hope you all have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and we will speak very soon thanks